Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Alhamdulillahirabbil alamin. Wassalatu wassalamu ala asyrofil anbiya wal mursalin wa ala alihi wasahbi ajmain. First and foremost, I would like to thank library for inviting me for this talk. You know, I never declined an invitation from the library. I've had a long relationship with the library. I've been in UIA for more than 30 years and since then I've been helping and collaborating with library on many many issues especially with regard to copyright. And I remember those days during Said Salim's time we work quite closely with each other. I also was introduced into the library association as well, the Academic Library Associations and attended some of their meetings um, together with um, Tuan Said Salim. Uh, now, um, this issue is very, very important, how COVID-19 pandemic has actually affected us in many, many ways, including um, learning, teaching, education, and has made us shift from the physical world into the virtual world. A lot of us are not ready for this. A lot of us are not ready for this, and we are scrambling, looking for solutions. But in the area of copyright, the move to allow remote access to copyright materials have been discussed for several decades already, right? In the US, they have this Copyright Teach Act, which was um, uh, passed in the year 2001 at that time to deal with distance learning. Um, and of course, at that time, distance learning is in a, uh, not the way we uh, are practicing it nowadays um, in terms of online educational platforms, but that was the precursor to uh, remote learning as far as copyright policy is concerned. And there are a lot of um, movement in the US especially to make copyright policy clearer to the user, especially with respect to fair use, which is an exception or defense for purposes of copyright infringement. Madam Noraini started the session very well. You know, I know a lot of librarian from many, many academic libraries, including National Library, who are honest people who want to make the best of copyright to facilitate access to information and education. They are not willing to play around with the law because they are not willing to take chances with the law because they are not the one who flout the law. They are always wanting to explore the boundaries of the law in a legal way, uh, wanting the law to be, to be made a lot clearer. Unfortunately, um, the library association in Malaysia are not so organized and are not strong enough to show a united force and you know, and and get policy changes as far as copyright is concerned, national policy changes, as well as to negotiate with publishers to allow them to give a better uh, licensing terms, you know, and and better services. And because of that, you know, a lot of copyright issues in Malaysia are not necessarily clear. Let me just start with that and then we can go and have a look at our provisions under the Copyright Act and I will just explain why a lot of things are not clear. Now, just to state that the aim of copyright is essentially to provide access to information while at the same time giving that form of protection that authors necessarily seek um, because they have spent quite some time in working on the work. We know that we are forced to move into remote learning because of MCO and this is just a timeline of our uh, MCO um, and as far as UIA is concerned we were not quite ready but actually quite a lot of hybrid learning is already being done in IRUM even before COVID-19. Now next please. Um, Europe which has a most stringent copyright legislation, of course, had a lot of difficulties with this remote learning. Um, the reason being is that the ex any exceptions to copyright law in Europe are supposed to be remunerated against, right? So they may have like library exception, they have like private use exception, they have um, what cash copies exception, but 
a lot of their exceptions are specified to uh, certain purposes and specified to the narrow um, the narrow uh, type of or kind of people who have access to those exceptions and as a, as a result you find that there are a lot of petition that has been drafted to um, bring the policy makers to attention that copyright law has become in an obstacle or inhibits proper distance learning and research during the coronavirus pandemic. And this is the letter written by Association of European Research Libraries. Next, please. And the next one, if you can see, is um, a letter also by a number of organizations who have written to the Director General of WIPO expressing the importance of Re revisiting copyright policy, you know, to pave the way for online learning and um, distance education. Next, please. Now, the reason why um, all this issue crops up is because once institutions move to the online world, then library being the main place where users typically get their material is not available to the um, students as well as to the lecturers. And um, this leads to lack of access to a lot of educational materials. In Malaysia, um, if you look at the kind of educational materials that, that are being prepared for educational purposes, if if is it if it is for primary or secondary school children, they are mostly mostly um, developed by the ministry um, with the cooperation of a number, you know, resource persons, and they are actually internally um, developed. And as a result, you know, it's as easy as the Ministry of Education making uh, available of this. Uh, educational materials to the students, to the uh, primary and secondary school children. But what about universities? Because a lot of our educational resources are actually published by private publishers, right? Private publishers. And a lot of these books are actually in, in physical form. Um, you may say that um, with regards to ebooks, um, access is a lot easier, you know, because it's already in ebook form, and therefore, the the most the library can do is extend their um, lending, right, from the physical books into the ebooks, right. But we all know that libraries also have very limited source or limited funding, and therefore, the amount of digital materials, whether it's in the form of ebooks or whether in the form of digital databases, are quite limited. There are still a lot of books which are in the physical form. So this has led to uh, access to educational and um, materials which are very, very crucial for education and research purposes. Now, next please. Some of the relevant issues that had, had that has been raised uh, with regards to remote learning are these, you know, whether remote teaching will fall within the ambit of fair dealing provisions on education enumerated under the Copyright Act 1987, whether pre-recorded video modules that contain third-party copyrighted materials which are uploaded in online platform is treated in a manner as face-to-face -face room teaching, and can the university libraries claim protection under the fair dealing provisions if they upload a digital version of the textbooks available in the physical copy? Now, I know that Puan Noraini has raised a number of other questions as well. I have put it in the last slides. We will deal with that one by one. Don't worry. Now, why are these issues being raised now? In Malaysia, uh, particularly, there are a number of provisions under the Copyright Act which will be relevant to education, but a lot of it deals with um, education in um, classroom purposes. Now, would that classroom be extended to virtual classroom? Um, would all these exceptions which is provided for under the Copyright Act 1987 will be applicable to remote teaching and learning. 
would the exception given to the libraries be covering um, or allowing them to lend a digital version of a physical book which they have in their library but because of mobility uh, restriction in mobility um, can they therefore scan the books and provide it for the students now, these are very very critical issues and quite contentious as well next please now let me just give you an, a, a general idea of what copyright is okay uh, start with the basic copyright is the exclusive right given to next please um, exclusive right given to the owner for copyright for a specific period copyright protection Malaysia is governed by the copyright at 1987 next slide please all right there is no system of registration for copyright in Malaysia and um, the duration for copyright is actually lifetime of the author plus 50 years after his death um, Malaysia the duration of copyright in Malaysia is still um, in its traditional form in the sense that um, it's still as per burn convention which is lifetime plus 50 um, other countries have actually extended it to lifetime plus 75 lifetime plus 70 and in certain specific circumstances even 100 years but Malaysia is still lifetime plus 50 now once that duration ended then the world will be in the public domain now one one of the question which prom madam noaini raised just now what is public domain is it public domain only in malaysia or is it public domain everywhere else in the world all right now intellectual property is territorial in nature right territorial in nature in the sense that if it falls into public domain in malaysia it only falls in public domain in malaysia but not in other parts of the world all right so if you have manuscripts or works in your library which is already um, in the public domain then what you can do like what uh, other top u.s libraries are doing like Cornell or Boston or Northeastern and all this movement, open culture, internet archive, what they are doing is essentially they digitized the old books which are in the public domain and make it accessible to everybody because the duration has um, basically expired. Now, copyright is eligible um, or protected automatically upon fulfillment of the following conditions. Um, sufficient effort has been written down and the author is a qualified person so the requirement for the uh, eligibility of copyright in Malaysia is quite minimal as soon as it is written down um, and completed copyright subsists all right and on top of that next please Next, please. The type of subject matters of protection under copyright is pretty embracing, right? It ranges from literary work, artistic, musical, film, sound recording, and broadcast, right? So it brought, uh, ranges from the physical work um, to the tangible work, intangible work, such as software and databases. So there's a wide range of um, products which are protected under copyright. A lot of this um, actually are content that we use on everyday basis. And some, a lot of these are quite useful for educational purposes. Next, please. Now, under the copyright at 1987, the author of the work is given a what you call a bundle of rights it's not a single right a bundle of rights so if you're an author you have a right to control the reproduction reproduction in any material form and if you scan someone else's work that will typically offend the reproduction right because scanning will be will be amounting to reproduction the communication to the public communication to the public is essentially the sharing of the work with the with a wider audience and if on top of scanning the book you share the book um well to others right uh, say you upload it into your facebook for example that would amount to the communication to the public B, the performance showing 
or playing to the public. Performance showing or playing to the public. This covers broadcast broadcast works. You know, if you have a television which you put it on all the time uh, in the library premises, or radio that you put it on all the time in the library premises, that would amount to performance showing or playing to the public. That is also the co within the control of the copyright owner. And fifth, the distribution of copies to the public by sale or other transfer of ownership. Okay, distribution of copies to the public by sale. Because of the word copies there, um, it has been interpreted to cover only you know, physical copies. So if you start distributing the work by selling or other form of uh, transfer of ownership, that will also offend the right of the copyright owner. And F, the commercial rental to the public. Let's say you have a copy of Siti Nohalida's Siti Nohaliza's CD, and you rent it out, you know, to your um, students, and that that would amount to commercial rental. So the author is then given a bundle of rights, right? Not a single of right, and whatever that you do may offend any of these exclusive rights. It can be by way of reproduction, by way of communication, by way of performance or by way of distribution or commercial rental. Now, typically, when you have a remote class, what you want to do is you set up an online class and then you share materials with your students, right? You share materials with your students. And you can do that in a number of ways. For example, you can scan the materials and then you then post it into your Google Classroom, for example. Now, scanning the materials would um, definitely often the reproduction right and posting it into google classroom would amount to communication to the public okay but wait um what lo what people normally advise is that if you have to share materials with your student because we know that when when, when you, you have a class in a remote class um, you definitely would need to share material with your students. So the advice is always try not to scan the whole book. There may be certain chapters of the book which is relevant to your student because in, in any copyright infringement action, you will not be liable if you only reproduce a, a minimum amount or, or not substantial part of the work, right? You will only be infringing if what you reproduce is a substantial part of the work. So you will not be excused if you scan the whole work. But you may be excused if you scan only a chapter of the book, which you think is very, very relevant to your students. Okay? And if you post it onto Facebook, that would amount to communication to the public. But if you keep the group in the Facebook into a private group, right? Because some of my friends are doing their teaching through Facebook, but only to a private group, then that will not amount to communication to the public. You are still, you know, curtailing or restricting the number of people who have access to the public. Then probably you be, um, you know, excused excuse from uh, infringing. Um, law because if you look at the provision on infringement right um, copyright is infringed by any person who does or causes any person to do without the license of the copyright owner an act the doing of which is controlled by copyright under this act so the the right is just now the five rights just now are rights which are controlled by the copyright owner and you cannot do anything that implicates those exclusive rights if you don't get the license of the copyright owner Right, now, typical of any copyright legislation, there are exceptions. Typical of any law provision, right? There are the rights and exceptions, okay? And these exceptions are typically raised under defense, right? Raised as a defense against copyright infringement. And as a result, it is not well laid out. Um, and the scope of fair dealing here is only understood from cases because, you know, it will only 
be raised when people are sued for copyright infringement and they cite fair dealing provision. So we have this fair dealing provision, right, which is laid down in section 36.2 and it says the right uh, not within subsection 1, the right of control under that subsection does not include the right to control the doing of any app, blah, 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 by way of fair dealing, right? By way of fair dealing, including for purposes of research, private study, criticism, review, or the reporting of news or current events, right? So, a lot of people are familiar with fair use provisions because fair use comes from the US and fair use is well elaborated in literature. When you Google, you can get a lot of materials on fair use and US being a very litigious society, there are plenty of cases that illustrate the boundary of fair use. But Malaysia being a common law jurisdiction, we together, we inherit this fair dealing provision from the UK and other common law jurisdictions also have this fair dealing provision. So you can actually be guided uh, from cases decided in the UK, cases decided in Australia, um, cases decided in Canada as to the meaning and scope of certain um, fair dealing um, purposes. Now, the the provision, as you see, says that um, does not include the right to control, blah, 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 if whatever you do is by way of fair dealing, right? For certain purposes, there are certain purposes only that can claim fair dealing. What are the purpose? Research. Right? Most students are doing research, lecturers are doing research, and that will justify you to um, flout with the exclusive rights given to the copyright owner, okay? because you are doing research. Like Madam Noraini mentioned just now, um, write me if I'm wrong. If you are doing research, then you are accepted from certain um, uh, duties under the copyright, which is true, okay? If you are doing research, um, second is private study, private, uh, private study. And because of the word private there, it's only confined to students. All right. It doesn't cover lecturers who try to facilitate the students by giving them the material necessary for their education. It doesn't extend to librarian who is facilitating the students. It only covers the student. So if you are running a, a remote class, which I'm sure most of you are, try to encourage your students to um, retrieve the material themselves and share it with their friends rather than you scanning and downloading materials and share it with the students because the private study exception covers the students. It doesn't cover the lecturer. It doesn't cover the librarian. Okay. Another purpose which is allowed is criticism, right? If you have to uh, reproduce certain work because of, for the purpose of criticism, like, you know, some of this movie uh, documentary, right? Um, Review, 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 uh, cinema, 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 right? So for purpose of criticism or review, right? Criticism is essentially, a ne uh, you know, like a negative um, review of a particular thing that is criticism. Why review may be a, in some form of appreciation of the work, right? And that is allowed. Or you have to reproduce work for the purpose of reporting of news reporting of news or current events. But the news or current events would have to be current. Uh, to enable you to enjoy the exception. Now, uh, next please. You are free to interject as you like, okay? This is just um, copyright uh, ABC. All right, or copyright uh, 1.0, okay? Now, in 2012, what happened is that um, we introduce the fair use factors into our Copyright Act, making us a hybrid country. We now have both fair dealing and fair use. We have both fair dealing and fair use. Why do we end up adopting fair use factors? Like I mentioned, fair use is more developed because you know, there are more cases um, decided in the US, there are more litigious society, and fair use is more flexible, right? 
flexible because um, it has these four factors and what it does is, is that in litigation, you have to weigh the four factors and see which one is heavier. Uh, is it in favor of the um, copyright owner or is it in favor of the copyright user? So you may have two factors in favor of the copyright owner and two factors in favor of the copyright user, but still it will not amount to infringing. And of course, US being a very litigious society, there are a lot of uh, cases involving Google, right, which will be very, very relevant to this online environment. Okay, online environment. While the fair dealing um, jurisprudence are very strict, the moment what you if, if the moment you reproduce with certain commercial intent, right, then automatically you're excluded from fair dealing. Okay, and and we all know that in this um, era, um, the distinction between um, private and for commercial entity is, is quite loose. A lot of educational institutions also embark on research with the intention of later trying to make some money out of it, right? So by having a very uh, rigid approach where the moment you try to make money out of your reproduction, ah, you can't claim fair dealing. And you are also restricting fair dealing into only the six specified purposes mentioned, right? While for the fair use, it doesn't matter. The purpose, can be any purpose. It can also be you coming up with a new platform like Google search, for example, right? It's a new um, platform for users. Of course, Google make tons of money from the Google search, but they don't make money from the Google search itself. They make money from advertising, but yet the court held that not to be infringing and falling within fair use factors because what they've done amounting to uh, coming up with useful platforms for the um, users. So in 2012, we adopted the fair use factors, basically because we want to be in line with what's happening in the world with regard to um, digital work and online, and, and especially digital work, um, so that, um, you know, Malaysia uh, will enjoy the same kind of flexibilities to promote science and technology. Okay. Now, let me just, pff, next please. Um, these are just some of the example of cases decided on fair dealing, right? These are UK cases. Um, if you look at it, the first one, right? It's not fair dealing for a trade rival to take copyright material and use it for his own benefit. In Time Warner, if you acquire works without the consent of the copyright owner, that is considered as not fair. Um, particularly if you um, you try to get the material without the owner's consent, that will be unfair. And if you reproduce too much, that will be also unfair. Okay, next please. So as you can see, the um, scope of fair dealing under the common law jurisdiction is pretty limited, very rigid, not as flexible as fair use. But what the librarian tells me is that even that so, it doesn't give much clarity to the user, right? Librarian, like any other user, would want to open up the copyright and, and see, okay, what type of use is allowed, okay? Is it for copy preservation? Um, scanning just the uh, table, page or content page, is that allowed? You know, uh, what if I only photocopy one chapter of a book, is that allowed? You, you would want some practical um, guidelines as to what is allowed and what is not allowed. Because as far as copyright law is concerned, they only give you some vague parameters. They say the copying must not be a substantial part of the work. They did not define what is a substantial part of the work, right? Now, um, and on top of that, uh, you may not know whether you are infringing or not until you are being sued because a lot of this fair use or fair dealing is only invoked by way of defense, right? You would rather want to know beforehand whether what you are doing is within the law or not. So, once we adopt the fair use factors, 
we should be looking at the guidelines which are which were you know formulated in the US the US have already um, some kind of guidelines on fair use what is allowed and what is not not allowed this is drafted by uh, the librarians when they organize the conference on fair use and there are more and more guidelines which is out there um, which gives greater clarification to the user as to what is allowed and what is not allowed and i would suggest that uh, the library malaysian librarian and the library uh, the academic library association get together get together and come up with guidelines on fair dealing and fair use in malaysia looking at what's happening in other countries in us particularly and just adopt all right and the reason why i'm saying this is because the copyright act uh, 2012 is now being revised and one of the provision which is being revised is the one on exception and limitation the fair dealing and the fair use provisions because the librarian is saying that you know that provision is not um, clear enough and does not give um, concise uh, ideas of what is allowed and what is not allowed okay next please now for librarian we have this exception okay library exception right section 13 subsection 2 subsection 1 library exception which which gives very broad powers to the library to use the works to any use of works in it any use of works it, it didn't even say that this is only li limited to um use of the work in a physical form right it says any use of works but despite that librarian is saying wait this provision does not give you much comfort because it just say any use of work why you would prefer it to say what is allowed right what is allowed rather than any use of works right? so if like uh, like i mentioned just now if i just copy the and, and circulate the um page um content page is that allowed if I circulate only uh, one chapter of a book, is that allowed? Now, I would suggest that those things are drafted in a form of guidelines, not in the statute itself, not in the copyright act itself, but you gather among yourselves, right? And you can call those who are teaching copyright law in Malaysia. We're more than happy to help you. And we can come down, we can come and sit down and come up with guidelines of, on what is allowed. Uh, to the librarian and what is allowed to the users. Now, of course, this uh, provision is very broad, it gives library the right to any use of works and works here, we don't even distinguish between um, literary, artistic, musical, broadcast, film, right? They are all included within works. The only limitations is that it must be used in public interest and we all know that libraries normally use it in public interest, compatible with fair practice, there's no profit, and no admission fee. All right, next, please. All right, we have a number of uh, cases in Malaysia on the exceptions. We don't have many cases in Malaysia that illustrate is the uh, exception provisions. One of it is this ultra dimension um, used under the control of government where the Malaysian Tourism Board qualifies to use photographs in tourist brochures as the usage is considered to be under the control of a government. All right, next, please. All right. There, there are also a number of other provisions which would be useful for remote learning, which is F, inclusion of a work in a broadcast, performance, showing or playing to the public, collection of literary or musical work, sound recording of film, when um, for educational purposes and that is allowed um, ff which is the quotation provision g again recording for uh, educational purposes and h reading or reciting in public by any person of a reasonable extract from a published literary work now these are small small uh, exceptions which equally be useful for for educational purposes yeah next please These are two new provisions which are included in 2012. Um, these are for transient copy and incidental electronic copy. And section 13.2 is for uh, the disabled community. So for disabled community, and UIA has, I wouldn't say a substantial number of um, 
uh, uh, disabled students, but we do have disabled students, right? So you are allowed to change the format of your ebook, right? Change the format of your ebook to make it um, readable and accessible to the uh, disabled community, right? The making and issuing of copies of any work into a format to cater for the special needs of people who are visually or hearing impaired and the issuing of such copies to the public. Okay, next, please. Any questions so far? No questions. All right, I'm just going through some of the useful provisions um, on um, use for educational purposes, right? Section 13, subsection 2, subsection L relates to use for judicial proceedings, right? For judicial proceedings, then you'll be able to reproduce certain words because you want to bring it to the court for purposes of litigation. Next, please. Now, like I mentioned just now, with COVID-19, it's just you and the screen and you can see your student's face on the screen and it's just you and the students communicating through WhatsApp, through YouTube, all right, and through whatever social media. How do you make sure that your students are reading the right thing to enable them to follow your lectures? Are you allowed to reproduce <coughs> some of the content of books to share it with your students? Like I mentioned, as much as possible, try and encourage your students to share the materials among themselves because they are covered under the private study exception, right? But that doesn't stop you from, say, um, you know, distributing certain parts of the content, the relevant ones, all right, as long as it is not substantial. Okay, as long as it is not substantial, then you can photocopy or scan. And what some lecturers do is they take photo of certain relevant pages of the books and share with the students. But the best strategy is for you to encourage your students to share the relevant materials among themselves. And if there is open access, go and have a look at the open access and you know, if there, there is link to a, a particular material which is relevant to them, then perhaps provide them with the link rather than you distributing the whole book to your students. Okay, next, please. Um, wow, well, now this, uh, okay, so what I'm suggesting is instead of you downloading and uploading files, be careful with downloading and uploading files. Some of the files may be um, subject to copyright protection. There is a misnomer that everything on the internet is free for all to use. That is not necessarily true. The reason is what I mentioned just now, once the work is created, copyright automatically exists. The author does not have to do anything more to claim copyright over the work. So um, try to do it the minimum in terms of downloading and uploading files, unless you are pretty sure that the files are not uh, subject to copyright protection. Scanning from physical documents, like I mentioned, try to keep it to the minimum. So the advice is always small is beautiful, right? Small is beautiful. Fair amount of copyright work for teaching illustration is allowed. Large amount requires permission. Now, remember my, during my days when we were doing um, PhD in, uh, in London um, in 1990s, at that time, photocopying was considered to be an evil, you know, um, and lecturers have this box in the library where we put whatever necessary materials, reading materials into that box. And we, we put that into the library and the students have to come and collect whatever they want and they photocopy themselves, right? Um, librarian cannot photocopy for, let's say if I have 40 students, librarian cannot photocopy 40 copies. Um, lecturers also don't copy 40 copies, right? But instead we have this box which have a collection of reading materials for our students and students are asked to photocopy themselves. We know cases in US where, you know, Kinko was signed 
was sued for infringement of copyright because they provide the reading materials to their students, right? We know library in um, Australia has also been sued for um, not not uh, supervising or monitoring photocopy. So, I mean, the, the equivalent is the same in this online environment, right? If you have to share with your students, again, small is beautiful. And if you want to illustrate a point, please have proper acknowledgement. The difficult part is always when you are dealing with image, because a lot of images are copy protected unless you get it from uh, open access or you get it from Creative Commons. Some of these images come with Creative Commons licenses. Be careful with the licenses because com Creative Commons licenses also have uh, some kind of uh, restriction, all right? And if you want to share YouTube um, videos with your student, like I said, better if you provide the link rather than re you reproduce it into your Google Classroom. Next, please. Okay, all right. So, digitize only the necessary parts, not entire book. Make content available only for class in a designated and online platform, not an open digital repository. So, if it is in Italim or Google Classroom, all right. Do not circulate copies, but keep them on intranet. Limit recording of live stream lectures. I know most of our lectures are recorded, but that is definitely with my consent, right? And when the exigent circumstances are over and face-to-face -face instruction resumes, stop using the digitized word or propane or obtain proper licenses for them. Um, we don't know how or when this COVID-19 pandemic is going to end. Um, well, as long as we're still in, in this COVID-19, I'm sure there are not many um, publishers who are willing to um, go to court and, you know, file a suit of infringement, but there are such cases in other countries. Okay, next, please. So, solution lies with ebook. Some people say solution can also lies in um, digital database, some people say, but you have to look at the license. The problem with ebook and digital database is that it is not only regulated by copyright, but also contract. You have to look at the licensing agreement, right? Is it limited to campus only? Is it limited to a number of simultaneous users? Is it restricting only to physical document delivery and not, you know, digital delivery? Is there any limits in terms of photocopying? So if academic libraries were to organize together, maybe as a group, you'd be able to negotiate with the publishers and ask for better exceptions in this COVID-19. Tell them that now that because most of your users are having remote access, right, remote access, then there is then a need to waive this limit to uh, on-campus only or limit the number of users that can have access to those materials. Now, these are all contractual issues and contractual issues requires negotiation. What all you need to do is negotiate with the publisher. I know it's as simple as that, but it's not easy because who are you, you know, in comparison to the um, publishers? That's why it'd be better if you work as a group, okay, together as a group, okay. The other thing is, um, encourage your students and your readers to um, leverage heavily on open access. There are, um, and in, for example, Internet Archive has tons of materials on the internet. Um, some, a lot of those materials can be useful for your students. It may not be the exact textbook that you are using in the classroom, but it may be useful for the students at least to have a, some background understanding on certain issues, for example. So leverage as much as possible on open access. And um, like uh, what American professors do is that uh, among ourselves, you know, we share materials um, which are in the public domain, which are in open access so that we can have uh, we can circulate it to our students. So uh, there, are, there are platform among the academics where we share resources among ourselves and our students. Okay, next please. All right, next please, that's the open access. Next please. All right, 
Now, in the US, they have considered um, remote teaching long, long time ago in 2001 when they have this Teach Act. All right, next please. Okay, um, like I think in my lecture, I have already touched on um, internet archive, open culture. It's actually a movement to make um, educational materials and uh, reading materials more accessible to others in a form of uh, digital form. And what they have done is they have digitized books and make it um, loan on loan basis uh, on the internet. Um, they have been sued by major publishers, but they are not finding it as a major problem um, because they feel that whatever, whatever they are doing is within uh, the limitations and permissions under the Copyright Act. Um, and actually, there are a lot of people who are supporting open access, um, open data, open culture. Previously, um, open access, open culture, and open data is considered to be um, the adversary of copyright. You know, But now, we know that it's just an alternative form to copyright. Um, previously, um, Copy left is looked upon like an evil, but now copy left is considered to be an alternate to copyright and even accepted within the mainstream of copyright uh, advocates. So we have to leverage on open access, open culture and open data and try to use a lot of the resources which are made available by these groups um, to, for our students. All right. So moving forward, last point, I can see that many have left because of the azan. <laughs> I'll try to cut short. So moving forward, the way forward is to actually digitize our resources and to leverage on uh, public domain lending, which um, some of the academics may be questioning, why are we using all books for our students, right? Because you know those are in the public domain would definitely be old materials, but it can be still useful um, in research and discourse. It may not be, you know, the, the current or contemporary um, discourse on a particular area, but it will be um, illustrative of uh, certain theories which were developed long time ago. Um, and it will be very, very relevant when you do a systematic research on a particular thing. And the other way is to, uh, like I mentioned, for the librarian to sit down, library association to sit down together and negotiate with the publishers, uh, particularly with regard to digital materials, online materials, right, ebooks, and um, also to sit down and come up with um, easy to follow guidelines on fair use and fair dealing. Um, I would have thought that would be the way forward for um, the <laughs> library in Malaysia. Now, let's look at your queries. Last one. Last one. Next. Ah, so if copyright duration of work has expired, right? So if it's expired, it, it only expired in Malaysia. It will be in public domain in Malaysia. All right. Fair use and fair dealing, are they different? All right. Fair use originated from the US is a US uh, doctrine. Fair dealing is a common law doctrine. They are different in many ways. But now Malaysia has adopted fair use. We are a hybrid country. So we can use both fair dealing and fair use. So make full use of the guidelines on fair use in the US and use that as a um, negotiating platform or uh, whatever I say, the kind of users which are allowed under the fair use provision, you make sure that you have those lists and present that to the authorities, particularly MIPO, because they're going to have a round of stakeholders discussion on the exception and limitation. Uh, you tell them that, you know, these are the list of uh, allowed usage in the US under the fair use provision. Therefore, it should be allowed in Malaysia as well. Okay. 
In which situation one needs to ask permission from the author creator, like in research, no need to ask the author's consent, enough to properly cite the works. Correct. In, in uh, teaching, like you mentioned, like I mentioned just now, there are a number of exceptions that deal with teaching. Like, for example, if you have to illustrate a certain point by using or reproducing um, a copyright work, then that will be allowed under uh, one of the exceptions, the uh, illustration purposes. So it's not only research, which is one exception. You can, f you can see from my presentation just now, there are, there are other exceptions that will be useful for educational purposes. Okay? Library exception, research exception, quotation exception, illustration for teaching purposes exception, and quite a number of other, other small exceptions that will be equally be useful for remote teaching. Okay, so if a work is a product like an app, is it better to file under copyright or patent or both if possible? Both is possible, depending how much money you have. How much money you are willing to invest? Because if you file a patent, that will cost what five thousand, ten thousand, the minimum ten thousand. If you file for voluntary notification, that will cost you only fifty ringgit. And how valuable the work is. Okay, what are the rights of the owner and author of the work? I already mentioned just now. There are five type of rights given to the author of the work. Author of the work is the one who wrote the work. Who develop the work. Owner is the one who has the economic power over the work. The owner may be the employer. Okay, If you work with UIA and you have been assigned to come up with um, modules for MOOC, right? the owner of the work will be UIA. But if you are just um, teaching your class online, and you say, for example, you uh, put in some uh, narration into your PowerPoint slides, that is essentially your work. You are the author of the work, and you probably be owning the work as well. UIA would not have any interest to claim right over the work. But if it is created out of a research project, um, which you be as an employee of, of UIA, that will be owned by UIA. Okay. What are the procedures involved to lodge a report upon copyright infringement? Um, well, you can um, lodge the report to the... Uh, there, there is this enforcement division, Kementerian Perdagangan Dalam Negeri um, dan Hal Ehwal Pengguna. I think the ministry's name has been changed. I'm, I'm yet to be updated of the name. I know that it has been changed. Okay, so whatever the name is now, there is this enforcement division, then you can lodge a report to the enforcement division if there is copyright infringement. If it is a physical uh, copying, if it is uh, something involving uh, online, then you probably report it to the um, multimedia commission. All right. Now, during this COVID-19 outbreak, what privileges a library can expect from the fair use, fair dealing provision since online services and resources are becoming a contemporary trend in education? Okay. What privileges a library can expect? Actually, if you look at the provision, the library provision just now, it says any use of a work. It is very, very broad depending on how brave you are. And I know librarians are um, law-abiding citizens. They don't want to simply take the risk. They would rather, um, you know, be guided. Okay, so I would suggest that you just among among the librarian acad academic libraries, you come up with um, uh, standard operating procedures as to the kind of services that you can provide especially in this COVID-19. So it's better to work as a group rather than, you know, work individually. All right. I hope that have answered all your questions. I'm sorry if I'm going it too fast. I'm open to questions now. All right. 
Madam Noraini, there's a question from Madam Noraini. What was the question? Let me get it. Can someone read it? Chat. All right, it's in the chat. Okay, now uh, let me deal with the question. Eh? Uh, from Hannah, talking about library's failure to monitor photocopy, is it sufficient to put out a reminder? That's good enough, right? Put out a reminder about copyright infringement. And if you have like librarian that uh, walk around the library just to remind the students of their uh, copyright, uh, duties that will be sufficient. What is not sufficient is you having that photocopy center downstairs. You used to have that photocopy center downstairs, which is not properly monitored. And at times, that photocopy center, they also photocopy the whole book. So you must have uh, your, the contract that you have with the photocopy center must also have some kind of um, waiver, right? Waiver. Um, in a sense that if they are sued for copyright infringement, um, you are exempted from liability. Although it doesn't give you a hundred percent exemption from liability, but it does give you a cushion, some some kind of cushion. Um, can we assume that any publication that is deposited in our institutional repository is adequately protected from copyright infringement? Um, at the moment, the institutional repository has some kind of uh, control, right, in terms of reproduction, correct? But um, a lot depend on the metadata uh, that is set by the reader or by the user or by the author. So the author must be adequately, um, adequately taught. If they are uploading an article which is published, in a journal, they should restrict it to only um, what I will say, viewing, but not downloading. Because if they make it available for downloading, then um, you know they'll get into trouble with the publisher. Uh, if you remember, at one point in time, ResearchGate was sued for copyright infringement because some of their users, what they did was they upload the published version of their article and made it widely available. And that, of course, would, um, I, I wouldn't say that infringe the publisher's right, uh, because once you publish, then there is this contractual arrangement that you have with the uh, publisher. So on top of copyright, there's another right that sits on top of copyright, which is contract, contract contractual relationship and at times um, you know authors give away their right to the publisher uh, when, at, when they allow the publisher to um, publish the work. So um, authors and I'm talking in UIA in the context of academic staff would have to be educated that you know if they are uh, posting a work which is published in a journal um, they are not supposed to make it available for downloading. Um, instead, they restrict it. They can share. It's open for them to share, right? Okay, they can leave their email, and if there are, uh, if others were to ask for copies of their work, um, it's okay for them actually to share the copies with others. But it's n once you uh, allow it to be downloading, it's like you are allowing the distribution of the work, which which goes against your publication, right? Yes, Anwar Hassan, please. Anwar Hassan wanted to ask a question. I'm listening. Meanwhile, uh, Prof. Ida nak tanya, uh, yeah. kalau dah, uh, that publication is available in open access, Okay. And there's no uh, problem with publisher, so we we also make it open access in our IRA. There's no problem, right? Yeah, no problem. That's why I said leverage on open access materials. There's a huge movement in the US on open access. A lot of my American professors' friends they prefer to publish their work in open access rather than you know um, restricted access. And publish some publishers they allow that as well. You have to pay a bit more if you want to have it open access. Yes, Anwar. Yeah, assalamualaikum. Waalaikumsalam. 
Uh, so just I would like to ask regarding to uh, the copyright of my. Uh, I have uh, in IPF we have the blue and uh, Islamic benchmark to replace the uh, conventional library. Uh, then uh, we have presented our our uh, model uh, last week in uh, OFI. Okay. In, uh, in France, then they have accepted our model to be the Islamic benchmark. But uh, now we want to register it as a copyright for uh, our authors who develop this model. So, is this considered as a copyright or? Yeah, yeah, you can easily file for voluntary notification if you want. It doesn't cost you much, it's only 50 ringgit. I think the library is providing that service now, right? Madam Irni? Yes, yes, yes. Yes, uh, you are you are the head of this. Uh, yeah, that's why, yeah. I, because I want to uh, be sure, I mean, if we can register it this way, because uh, this presentation uh, has been uh, like uh, globally, and then we want to keep our right, uh, our copyright before, uh, before they uh, copy the model and uh, publish it under their, their name. Yeah, why not? Go, go and do it if you want. So, uh, is there any form, anything to fill up? And the forms are there with the copyright um, uh, unit get, of, the of the library. Yeah, can we get a copy of the copyright uh, form? Can I ask this question, Doctor? Uh, Dr. Dr. Anwar? Yeah. Uh, I will email you uh, all the requirements that we want. Uh, actually, you have to fill in uh, a disclosure form and then you have to submit to us the work itself as well as the uh, turn it in report. Yeah, sure. But this one in Arabic language can uh, accessible? Sorry, because, in Arabic? Yeah, because the conference or the office actually they, they develop the the standard by Arabic language. So when we propose, uh, when we send them the proposal, uh, we write we wrote it in Arabic yes. language. So uh, uh, no can problem. I just, no problem. You may can just uh, send it to us. No problem. Inshallah. Okay then. Thank you very much. Please send me the right form. I will uh, fill up the form and attach all the materials relevant. Okay. Inshallah. You are from IBF, right, doctor? Yeah. Yeah. From IBF. Okay. Okay. Uh, Prof. Ida. Yes. Prof. Ida, uh, yeah, I, I, would, I would like to take the opportunity to actually uh, uh, disclose the fact that uh, now the copyright unit is headed by uh, Sister Nozelatun. Uh, Nozelatun, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I saw her responding the question just now. I may have got yes. the wrong person because Madam Irni always attend our meeting so automatically i think of her <laughs> she oh, attend ucps she attend i call meetings so automatically i think of her <laughs> she's the law liaison all right yes law liaison yes yeah thank you madam Raini. Yeah. any other questions i'm so sorry if i went through the slides very quickly you know i wasn't sure how long i have as well with and i saw some people are leaving so i speed up uh, the Discussion. Yes, Wanhana has a question just now. Libraries providing, yeah, they supply the full articles. I think it should be okay. Document delivery is an old service provided by library. The reason why it is okay is that because you photocopy one article out of the whole journal, right? You supply one article out of the whole journal. And well, according to standard practice, it's okay. It's allowed. Uh, Assalamualaikum, Prof. Ida. Waalaikumsalam. Madam Sharifah. Uh, yeah. Uh, okay, currently we, we, for the online TC, so publish, we openly publish the first 24 pages of TC. Okay. So then uh, the full text is, con is controlled. Right. So then, can it be the four pages can be part of the 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 fair use? Yeah. Um, can be assumed as the the, the fair yeah. use. Yeah. Why thirty pages? Now there is there is this um, practice that says 
if you copy 10% of the work, it's allowed. 10%. So this is typically 300 pages, kan? Mm. So 30 pages, okay lah. So, uh, yeah. yeah. But uh. if you look at what Google so has done, okay. what Google has done, the Google Books, kan? The Google Books. What they have done is worse than that. They went ahead and digitized whole books. And they were sued actually for copyright infringement, but they um, get away from infringing because even though the whole book has been scanned, but users can only view um, according to their key, keyword search. So if you search for economics, right? So whenever economics appear in the book, right? 10 lines before and 10 lines after. That is the only thing that you can view on the screen. Now, Google, Google of course, is a classic example of a, a, a big IT company who managed to challenge copyright boundaries to the utmost. And, you know, they, they won many, many cases. Um, the Google search, right, where they provide uh, image of um, image, I'm talking about image and image is the most problematic because there's no way in which you say you reproduce only part of an image, right? Either it's an image or not an image. So what they did was they reproduce it in thumbnail version but it's the whole image nevertheless but they were not considered to be infringing because without their facilities, users are not able to search image. So they are um, they are championing the, uh, you know, the right to um, search uh, image materials online. And what they've done with Google Book even Bye. last year, right? They went ahead and scanned the whole books and they were sued. But regardless, they were found not infringing because even though the whole work is for um, scan, but what users see is only a um, few pages of uh, the book. So I know our library has but also then a lot of actually, materials, can. Betul tak? Our library mm. has. But um, then you. But then but that but but you convert, but you convert the the format. So they mean you convert from the print to the digital. That one is already infringed yes, the copyright yes, law, is it? Yes. Yes. If it's it, if it's decided under the fair dealing provision, automatically it will found it be found infringing, because under the fair dealing provision, once you reproduce a substantial amount of the work, that itself is already an infringement. But under the fair use provision, you have to apply these four factors. Okay, four factors. If you go back to the four factors, go back to slide number. Uh, let me just illustrate how the fair use factors works. Um, slide number 10. Okay, slide number 10. Um, amount and substantiality. If you uh, reproduce substantially, that factor will go against you. But if you reproduce it for um, private study, criticism, mm -hmm. research, or like Google, they are actually coming up with a new search engine, right? That is that is useful for the users. That will go in favor of Google. All right. So nature of the work is the work is creative. The, the, the more creative it is, um, the more protection the court gave to the work. All right. So if the work is creative, then if you photocopy freely, then of course that will go against you. Okay. So now, Two factors are already against Google, right? Nature of the work. These are all literary work and it's not easy to uh, develop. They also scan the whole book. That, that also goes against Google. But what is the purpose of the reproduction? It's actually to um, enable, uh, to, to have, to give users access to the material, okay, which otherwise would not be, right? And what is the effect on the potential market? Is it competing with the original publisher or not? And because what you can get on the internet is only excerpts of the book, it will not affect the publication market because, you know, users will still want to buy the book, the whole book. 
So as you can see in the context of Google Book just now, two factors go against Google. Two factors go in favor of, um, go, go against the publisher. So now you have two and two, right? Two on one hand and two on the other hand. So the court then have to um, use their discretion and decide whether this new tool, which is done by Google, um, would be useful to the users or not. Okay, freedom of expression, freedom of uh, access to information, access to education, those are all lofty human rights, ideal that can be used by the court to decide in favor of Google instead of favoring the publisher. Okay, so as you can see, the fair use factors will be loved upon by the lawyers. Lawyers will play around with words, right? Will be loved by the judges because then judges have more factors to weigh instead of like, oh, immediately substantial reproduction infringement. Because that is very rigid. And that is the approach under fair dealing provision. All right. Is that, is that a useful explanation already? of the difference between fair use and fair dealing. Will it be against the law if the library reveal a contact number of an author or thesis to requester? That depends. Um, you know, in the IRAP, in the IRAP, when we deposit a particular um, material, normally there's a column that gives our email uh, address, right? Um, if uh, other people is interested to contact us for purposes of getting a copy of the material, um, then it will not, then of course it is okay. And that's already standard practice, isn't it? Okay? Am I going too fast? <laughs> Sorry, yes, bro. Bro. going too fast. Is the, is the author. Sorry, the okay, I'm listening. If the author do yeah, not I'm enter listening. the his or her if contact the number, enter the his or her contact number. Well, email address oh. can be Google easily nowadays, right? People share email address in research in it is open for the user to try and contact you and get a copy of the work. And some people even have their own blog and they share it with others. Why, why do we become a member of LinkedIn and uh, we want to share our material, isn't it? Isn't it? So better we advise the requester for the contact number through the media social Maybe not contact number, maybe not handphone number. number. Email address would be okay. Okay, understand. Thank you, Pro. Understand. All right. <laughs> no, uh, Prof. Yes. Nor any here. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. I, I just like to uh, bring to us a situation. Okay. For example, okay. um, say say uh, if the library has got the intention of uh, collecting all the resources of the uh, authors uh, in the field of islamic studies okay and then they these are all the classical works okay you know the, okay. these classical works are not uh, subject to any uh, copyright law because uh, uh, kita punya ulama and all these scholars one day would rather uh, they are works to be, you know, passed circulated. on. Yeah. Circulated, yeah. Yes, circulated yeah. Uh, supaya ilmu tu diperpanjangkan, kan? All right. Okay. All right. Uh, so, but if the library wishes to uh, collect, to collect um, uh, works, mm -hmm. say maybe mm -hmm. if we can get some uh, that has been collected by uh, certain academics, certain lecturers, and then we want to put in our server, so that it is, uh, it can be further circulated uh, and used by our clients. So uh, that situation, where will that leave us? What's stopping you? What's stopping you? <coughs> no, uh, whether 
we can do that or not because uh, some of uh, um, the lecturers they they pointed out that uh, they got this from a certain library say for example from the uh, libraries of the uh, Masjid Nabawi of uh, Madinah to Munawara, for example. Uh -huh. So, uh, uh -huh. and then uh, they got it uh, through friends. Um, and uh, those works are sometimes being reproduced by uh, publishers there in the uh, Middle East, for example. So, so are we uh, infringing? Okay. Okay. Um, so copyright still subsists. Copyright still subsists. That is the first thing that you have to check. That you have to check. Okay. Right. Okay. Because um, you know this. Because, uh, this, because this, this you mentioned is still being published, published, right? Published, right. Yes. So, so the, the ownership, the, the ownership may goes to the publisher, right? Yeah, publisher. Yeah, publisher. Yeah. Mm, yeah. Even though these are classical works, yeah, yeah. The best yeah. is to contact the publisher and see if they have any yeah. issues as to you, you um, digitizing the work. But, the work. but like, I like I mentioned, like I mentioned, like depends, I mentioned. On, how, depends on how how brief you are. Brief you are. How brief, you are, How brief right? you are, right? If the work, if the is, work is clearly, clearly in the public domain, in the public domain already, because um, the author may be in 18th century, in 18th century. correct? Correct. Then, then it's already it's in already public domain, in public domain available for everybody to use. Mm -hmm. So there's nothing to stop there's you. nothing to stop you. Well, uh, the publishing practice, you know, uh, whether it is protected by copyright law or not in the Middle East is uh, very lacking, very slacking. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. I think that's just like uh, copyright plus 50 as well. Mm. Okay. Lifetime plus 50. Lifetime plus 50. All right. Lifetime mm. plus 50. Yeah. yeah. So if it's an 18th century work, then of course it's not in the public domain. In um, um, 19th century work is already in the public domain. Some of P. Ramli's work is already in the public domain. Yeah, some, not all. Not all. Because he passed away in 1976, right? But some of the work is based on uh, the date of publication rather than from his death, especially corporate work. What which belong to, belong uh, to uh, the company that he's working with, with, Shaw Brothers, I'm saying. Yeah. yeah. All right. Thank you, Prof. Okay. okay. It's been nice talking to all of you. I hope it has been useful. Okay. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a very interesting talk and we, I think we have, uh, I mean, the understanding has increased uh, on copyright matters. Uh, and then... Um, How active are you in having a meeting with other academic libraries? Yes, that's good. Actually, um, yeah. we should work as a, a group rather than singly. Especially UM. I think UM is quite active. You mean and National can... Library. You mean the commission, bro? And talking about pushing for copyright policy, you know, oh. um, copyright policy uh, changes, uh, coming up with guidelines, you know, and, uh, and standard and operating procedure. Uh, you know, it's a lot of uh, things that you provide, the service you provide in the library, you can always um, benchmark can always with other universities rather than being single. Okay. We we will take up your suggestion, bro. Please. Inshallah. <laughs> okay, thank you very much for uh, the talk, uh, Prof. Um, actually, I have uh, an early announcement to be made. Okay. Uh, we will be having another copyright talk uh, on 2nd November, inshallah.
Uh -huh. We invite everybody. Uh, the time will be at uh, ten thirty a.m. in the morning. So please block your calendar, uh, and please make sure uh, to free yourself so that you can join uh, this interesting uh, topic on the right. We will invite Professor uh, from Po this time. From my Po, who from my Po has agreed to come and join you? Uh, Alhamdulillah. Sapa uh, sapa? Pan Rashida. Ah, uh, Rashida is the right person. Yeah, the She's the yeah, she's the right person, and I I would really suggest mm -hmm. that you speak to her about the copyright um revision, because one of the area that is being revised now is the exception and limitation, and one of the area that she is looking now is the library exception. Tell her your concerns and what you want to be incorporated into the uh, revision. Okay. Thank you. All right. Okay. Uh, with that, uh, we end the session by a recitation of Suratul As and Tasbihi Farah. Thank you, everybody, for uh, attending this talk and for your uh, attention and cooperation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Okay, thank you all. Okay, thank you all. Thank you. For all the silent viewers, thank you very much. I have been useful. Thank you. Thank you.